So uh, this next lecture unit that we're going to go over is going to help us out with the, the final topic, which is water, um, which is a way that we power our body. Remember, we've talked about food with the digestive system. Um, we've talked about air um, with the respiratory system. Now we're talking about water. And the way our body helps regulate that water is through the urinary system. A relatively easy organ system um, to kind of grasp and, and go over. Some of the key things that you're going to have to know is you're going to have to know the basic anatomy um, of a kidney. Um, you're also going to have to be able to know the ins and outs of that whole entire nephron um, structure that's the little tiny filtration units of the actual kidney itself. So um, those are some of the key things you want to keep in mind uh, when you're studying for the urinary system. So the first thing we have to be able to do is uh, identify um, what the uh, major function of the urinary system is. And uh, the first major function that we have of the urinary system is going to be to eliminate a, a basic waste products is what it does. Um, so it's going to eliminate nitrogenous waste. Remember, nitrogenous waste is nitrogen-based waste. Um, a lot of times this nitrogenous waste is from the breakdown of, uh, of our proteins. And uh, when we break down proteins, the part we don't need is this nitrogenous waste. Um, it also eliminates toxins from our body, as well as eliminates drugs uh, from our body as well. So major function is to eliminate waste products from our body. Things our body does not need, the kidneys are going to clean um, that blood out and eliminate those products. Remember, the, the kidneys are going to deal with liquid waste um, is what they're going to deal with um, a lot of times is what they're going to put in the urine. It's things our body doesn't need as far as that liquid waste product is concerned. It's going to clean your blood. So how does your kidneys help maintain homeostasis? How does the urinary system help maintain homeostasis? Um, one thing that it does is it helps regulate water balance. Um, this hormone called vasopressin has a great effect. Uh, on uh, on the kidneys and helping it maintain water balance and, and keeping water in or eliminating water from the body depending on, on if you're overhydrated or you're dehydrated. Also helps maintain electrolyte balance. Remember electrolytes are those sodium potassium ions um, that we talked a little bit about in the nervous system. So helping to regulate the balance of those electrolytes also helps maintain acid base balance of our body's blood itself and tries to maintain the pH of that system itself. Also it's going to help regulate blood pressure. Um, if I have more fluid that's in my blood or more stuff, fluid that's in my blood, that's going to make my blood pressure be a little bit higher. If I have less fluid or less stuff in my blood, um, that's going to make my blood pressure be lower. Um, it's also going to regulate the, uh, the, the red blood cell production um, by the, uh, the production of a hormone called erythropoietin, um, which is released by the kidneys, and that's going to stimulate the, uh, the production of red blood cells. Also plays a role in uh, activation of the vitamin D. Uh, molecule itself. Remember, you need sunlight for vitamin D, and then your kidneys also play a role in, uh, in helping to produce uh, this vitamin D itself. Remember, vitamin D is needed for uh, calcium reabsorption um, in your intestines, as well as uh, a variety of other minerals are also helped with uh, vitamin D uh, being produced and uh, allowing those other molecules to be absorbed as well. Major organs of the urinary system. So one of the very first things we did is we got out the mannequin and we put these major organs on the urinary system. Um, the kidneys, the ureter, the urinary bladder, and then the urethra. So those are the four major organs of the urinary system. Relatively simple structures themselves. Um, not that hard to, uh, to learn about them or know where their location is at. So here you have the kidneys that are sitting here. Then you have the ureter that's coming down here. Ureter is going to drain into the bladder. And then that bladder has a tube that's coming out that's going to be the urethra. So those are the major structures of the urinary system. These are your kidneys that you can see. Your kidneys kind of sit right around uh, between this 11th and 12th vertebrate. Uh, note that the right kidney sits a little bit lower uh, on this person than the left kidney. Um, they sit against the dorsal body wall. Um, they're at the level of the T11 uh, to L3 vertebrae. Let me see the, the T12 to L3 vertebrae. Um, the right kidney sits slightly lower than the left due to the position of the liver. Remember that liver hangs down on the right side um, of the body a little bit more. Um, which causes that, uh, that kidney to be compressed down just a little bit more. So some of the, the structures of the kidney that we have to know, we have to know this little indentation of the kidney. It's called the renal hilum. Um, and this is where all these tubules come in or come out of the kidney. That's where you have the ureter, the renal artery, and the renal vein. And major nerves are also coming out of that renal hilum area itself. At the top of the kidney sits the adrenal gland. Um, we studied the adrenal gland a little bit in the endocrine system and the hormones that are released by it. Some of the major regions of the kidney that you're going to have to know. So the kidney is divided into three major regions. You have the outer region that's called the cortex. 
The middle layer that's called the medulla, the renal medulla, and then the inner layer is called the renal pelvis. So you can see out here, this layer right here is called the renal cortex. The very outside of your kidneys is called the renal capsule. So this very outside is called the renal capsule. But this layer right here is called the renal cortex. This middle layer is called the renal medulla. And then this inner layer is called the renal pelvis. And note the renal pelvis and runs continue this with the ureter that's running down here. This indentation right here, this is called the renal hilum. This area of indentation right here is called the renal hilum that I just talked about a little bit earlier. So you have the cortex, the medulla, and then you have the renal pelvis that's sitting right here. Uh, I'm not going to show you a close-up of an actual kidney that you guys dissected in class. I'm um, just kind of show you these layers in that kidney itself, looking at the real kidney. It's one thing, guys, to look at the actual uh, cartoon diagram of it, but it's another thing to actually see a physical kidney itself. See, so this is the uh, the outside of the kidney that you can see right here. So we call this all, it's called the renal capsule that's itself. You can see right here is this little indentation that we're looking at right here. This is the renal hilum. So this is that renal hilum that's there. I'm going to open up the kidney now. And you're going to see the inside of the kidney. And you should be able to identify the three distinct layers that we just talked about earlier. This all right here is going to be that renal cortex. This dark gray area that's right here, that's the renal medulla. And then this inner layer that's all right here is the renal pelvis. So those are those three major layers that I just showed you on that cartoon diagram itself. Again, you have the cortex, the medulla, and then the renal pelvis. So inside the renal medulla, um, you have these structures that we call medullary pyramids. Um, they're triangular layers of tissue that you see. So you see these little triangles that are in there. And then inside of the renal pelvis, you have these little cup-shaped structures that we have that are going to funnel urine, urine to the renal pelvis. We call this calyx. Um, you have major calyx and minor calyx as well. So I'll show you those in this diagram right here again. So right here, these little structures right here, okay, these are called these medullary pyramids that are here. So these are medullary pyramids that are here. These are medullary pyramids that are here. This is a medullary pyramid that's here. And these little appendages, these little appendages that come off the renal pelvis are called calyx. So a major calyx would be like a river. A minor calyx would be like a little branch off this river, like a creek that's running here. But basically, urine's going to drain into here. And then this urine's then going to drain from the minor calyx to a major calyx into the renal pelvis. Um, and then it's going to go down to the ureter itself. Um, basically, out here you have a ton of nephrons that are located. Um, are all mostly located in between the uh, in between the the cortex and the medulla is where we find these nephrons. Um, is where they're located at. So you find all these nephrons that are located out here, um, which we're going to talk about here in, in a little bit uh, later. Again, you can see uh, the medulla. Uh, right here, these are the medullary pyramids that you can see. And then it's pointing out the major calyx and a minor calyx um, in a kidney. We take a look at blood supply. How much blood actually goes through the uh, uh, kidney each minute? So a quarter of your body's blood supply goes through uh, the kidneys every single minute. That's pretty remarkable. Um, what's providing the kidney with the blood is the renal artery. So the renal artery is going to be that tube that's coming in at that renal hilum, and that's going to supply the kidney with blood. Blood's going to flow out of the kidney um, through the renal vein. So blood comes out of the kidney um, through the renal vein. When we take a look at an actual kidney itself, there's these little tiny filtration units that are the structural filtrational units of a kidney, um, and they're going to be the ones, the little tiny units that are responsible for forming urine. You have millions of these that are in your kidneys. You have millions of these microscopic um, structures that are responsible for cleaning out the blood. Um, and these little tiny structures are called nephrons. Um, there's two main structures that we have when you look at a nephron. Um, one's the glomerulus, and the other part's the renal tubules themselves. You can see this is where the nephrons kind of hang out. Uh, most nephrons kind of hang out in this renal cortex area, with components of them going all the way down to the renal medulla. So you have two different types of nephrons. You have cortical nephrons, um, which hang out almost exclusively in the cortex. And you have juxtamedullary uh, nephrons that hang out in the cortex, and then parts of them hang out in the medulla as well. Um, but these are two different types of nephrons that you have 
but they do the exact same thing. It's just their location's a little bit different compared to uh, uh, to one another. One hangs out almost exclusively in the cortex, the other one hangs out in the cortex and the medulla. So we take a look at a nephron. Um, the first component of a nephron you have is a glomerulus. And a glomerulus is basically a knot of capillaries um, that's going to lead into a structure that's called the Bowman's capsule. And uh, the glomerulus um, basically is this giant knot of capillaries that I'm going to show you here. Um, that looks like this right here. So you have this giant, you have an afferent arterial that goes into the glomerulus. And this glomerulus is a giant knot of capillaries that has these little tiny slits in it. And these little tiny slits are going to just allow anything that's in the blood that's small enough is going to get filtered out and go into this cup-like structure that's called the Bowman's capsule. So you basically have the, go the, the glomerulus that's here, and then you have a cup that surrounds it. Okay, This cup that surrounds it right here, this is the, this is the Bowman's capsule that's here, and then here's your glomerulus that's here. But anything of a particular size that's small enough is automatically going to get filtered out right here. So the job of the glomerulus is to filter things. Um, so everything that is small enough gets filtered out into the Bowman's capsule. Once you make your way into the Bowman's capsule and towards this proximal convoluted tubule that's right here, you're considered filtrate. Okay, so all this stuff that's here that's going to make its way in here that gets filtered out is considered filtrate. Now, not everything gets filtered out here in the Bowman's capsule. Some things are too large, like red blood cells are really large. We don't want red blood cells being filtered out because they're so big. Um, and we don't want to get rid of red blood cells anyway. We want to keep them in our bloodstream. Um, but things like drugs and toxins and things like that, they may be very large and they don't get filtered out here. They're going to come through this structure here called the efferent arterial. And notice the size difference. This tends to have a bigger size. Afferent has a large size. The efferent has a smaller size. Um, so this is going to build up pressure. You can see this would be like kinking a hose here. If I kink this hose here, there's going to be a ton of pressure that builds up in here to filter things out of a particular size. Your water automatically gets filtered out here. Remember, all this stuff that becomes filtrate, though, is not going to become urine. 99.9, um, 99% 99 .9, 99 of the stuff that becomes filtrate um, eventually becomes reabsorbed um, back in your bloodstream. So everything of a particular size is going to get filtered out by the glomerulus. These are these little tiny slits, uh, microscopic. I know we talk about these things in cartoon diagrams and things like that. But this is an actual microscopic analyzation of these little tiny slits um, of the glomerulus. Um, where these things of a particular size are going to filter out um, those products that are in the blood. So we take a look at the anatomy of a nephron. You have the renal tube you extends from the glomerular capsule um, to the collecting ducts. So you have the Bowman's capsule. So the tubule starts with the Bowman's capsule. Then you have the proximal convoluted tubule, also known as the PCT. Then you have the loop of Henle. Then you have the distal convoluted tubule. So these are the major parts of the renal tubule. You have the, the Bowman's capsule. The PCT, proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. So where these things are located at, right here is the Bowman's capsule. This tubule that's closest to the Bowman's capsule is called the proximal convoluted tubule. This is all the proximal convoluted tubule that's right here. As I move down this structure right here, this is now becoming the loop of Henle. On the other side of the loop of Henle, once I'm over here, this is called the distal convoluted tubule, also known as the DCT. As I come down the distal convoluted tubule right here, it becomes the collecting duct. Now, this collecting duct is going to drain, drain into the medulla, which is eventually going to drain into those calyx. And then this is going to eventually then, uh, urine is going to come out of here, and then this urine is going to go from that calyx, uh, from that minor calyx to the major calyx, into the renal pelvis, down the ureter, ureter, bladder, um, bladder to urethra. And then urethra, um, that urine is going to go to the toilet. So the collecting ducts are going to receive urine from many nephrons. They run through the medullary pyramids. They deliver urine to the calyx um, and to the renal pelvis itself, um, what I just talked about. So basically, the path of urine is basically you're going to come into the Bowman's capsule. Um, if you're small enough, you're going to go into the Bowman's capsule. And let's say you're, you're, this is completely something that your body doesn't need. Okay, So say that this is urea. This is a, a, a product of breaking down proteins. And uh, it's going to travel this way. It's going to go, let me get my point out here. It's going to go through the proximal convoluted tubule. And it's going to come all the way down here to the loop of Henle. Loop of Henle. It's going to go to the distal convoluted tubule. Then it's going to come all the way down the collecting ducts. And then the collecting ducts is going to drain into the um, end of the calyx, calyx into the pelvis, pelvis then into the ureter. Ureter to bladder, bladder to urethra. 
And note, guys, when you look at this collecting duct, this collecting duct has a whole bunch of other little tubules coming off of it because other nephrons are going to hook up to this same collecting duct. So one collecting duct can service multiple nephrons. Remember, guys, not all this stuff that's in this renal tubule is going to become urine. Okay, 99% 99 of this is going to get reabsorbed and come out of this renal tubule and go back in your bloodstream. Only a small, minute portion of this is going to actually become urine. Um, in class, I showed you guys a, a visual of just like basically your body's producing, every minute it's producing one little raindrop of urine. So every minute your body produces one little raindrop of urine. And remember, your core of your blood is going through your kidneys in one minute. So that's just a small percentage uh, of this is actually becoming urine. Another thing to take a look at here is surrounding the nephron, you have these capillaries, they're called protubulary capillaries. And this is where your reabsorption and secretion are going to go. Um, remember with secretion, um, secretion we're going to go from the bloodstream into the renal tubules. With reabsorption we're going to go from the renal tubules into the bloodstream. And I'm going to talk about that just in a little bit here. These are what's feeding the glomerulus um, by arterioles. You have the afferent arterial um, that's going to go into the glomerulus. Leaving the glomerulus, you have the efferent arterial. Remember, E exit, efferent exit. Um, this is going to receive blood that's passed through the glomerulus. Remember, things that are too big that didn't get filtered out here um, are going to come into the efferent arterial. The glomerulus, the major function of the glomerulus is filtration. So the major thing that the glomerulus does is it filters. Um, it's going to force fluids uh, and solutes out of the blood into the glomerular capsule. Not all this stuff is going to become urine. So this is just kind of showing you the afferent arterial, the glomerular system where filtration occurs. As we move down the tubule itself, we have secretion, we have reabsorption. This C is representing tubular secretion. Let me move this out of the way. So you can see as I move down the... Uh, the renal tubule, um, I have, this is represented, these representing re reabsorption. Re reabsorption, we're taking that filtrate, that stuff that we need in the filtrate, and we're taking it out of the uh, filtrate, and we're putting it back into the bloodstream. That's reabsorption. Secretion is things that our body still doesn't need, that were stuck in the bloodstream, that didn't get filtered out initially. It's going to go from the bloodstream, those particular capillaries, um, back into the, uh, into the renal tubules itself. So this is, this is kind of an important little diagram to kind of, uh, allow you to understand where this stuff is taking place. So the protubulary capillaries, um, they're going to arise from the efferent arterial. Um, they're just regular low pressure capillaries. Um, they're adapted for absorption instead of filtration. Um, so they're, they're, they're highly adapted for absorption. They can take a lot of things in from these protubular, from the, uh, from the renal tubules themselves. Um, they, they cling real close to the renal tubule, the proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, and the loop of Henle. Um, so they can reclaim a lot of these substances that are needed. Remember, your body needs water, so a lot of this water is going to get reabsorbed. So in order to form urine, three things must happen. You have to have glomerular filtration, you have to have tubular reabsorption, and you have to have tubular secretion. Those are the three things that must occur in order for our bodies to be able to produce urine. Mm -hmm. We take a look at filtration, um, which is the first process of urine formation. Um, filtration is a non-selective process, um, meaning that it's non-selective passive process, meaning that it happens just because you're of a particular size, you're going to get filtered out. Um, if you're too big, you're not going to be able to get filtered out. Um, water and solutes, um, smaller than proteins, are going to be forced through the capillary walls. Um, things that tend to stay in um, at this period of time are proteins and blood cells. They're too large to pass through this filtration um, membrane that's associated with the glomerulus. The filtrate's collected in the glomerular, glomerular capsule. It's also called the Bowman's capsule. And then it's going to leave via the renal tubule. So we take a look at reabsorption. So as we go through this process, things that our body's going to reabsorb that got filtered out initially by the glomerulus, our body keeps water. Our body tries to keep as much water as it can. Um, but there is some water that's going to come out and become urine, but most of your water does get reabsorbed. Your body's also going to keep glucose. Your body needs glucose because glucose is the major way that our body's uh, going to be able to produce ATP. 
Um, as we go through the cellular respiration, one of the things we put in the cellular respiration is glucose. Remember, if glucose is not present, um, that's when our body's going to tap into fat in order to produce ATP. But we want to try to keep glucose inside of our body. So this, this glucose that gets, uh, that gets filtered out by the glomerulus becomes reabsorbed. Amino acids. Your body wants to have these amino acids to help build proteins and things like that. So your body keeps these amino acids in. And various ions as well are going to get reabsorbed. Uh, by your bloodstream uh, as well. Um, by the yeah, your your pituitary capillary is also going to reabsorb some of these ions. Um, most reabsorption is is uh, is active. Um, some of it's passive. Um, what I mean by active is it's going to require ATP. It's going to require some form of energy um, in order to get it to come across that membrane um, back into your bloodstream. Um, so it is an active process, and a lot of times we're going against that concentration gradient. Uh, for some of the time, um, so it's going to require uh, it's going to require ATP um, and be an active process. Uh, although some of it is passive process, but for the most part, it's an active process. Most of your reabsorption, so the majority of your reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. And what I mean by that is when I take a look at this diagram here, um, you can see that uh, you can see I have the glomerulus. It's here. But most of your reabsorption is going to take care of itself right here in this proximal convoluted tubule. Remember, reabsorption is going from the renal tubule into the bloodstream. And what happens is your body tries to take care of reabsorption right away in this proximal convoluted tubule. And then what it doesn't get accomplished, it still has the rest of the nephron to kind of take care of um, getting things reabsorbed that it needs. But right away, we try to reabsorb as many things that are possibly still needed in our blood um, initially. So most of your reabsorption is going to occur right here in this proximal convoluted tubule. And you can see these arrows that are going out here. I can see if I compare this to over here, I can see there's a lot more reabsorption occurring in the proximal convoluted tubule. And you can see things are getting reabsorbed. Right here, glucose is getting reabsorbed. Right here, water is getting re reabsorbed. Um, here's some ions that are getting reabsorbed. Here's your sodium chloride that's getting reabsorbed. Um, that's in this particular area that's right here. Now, the opposite of reabsorption, the opposite of reabsorption is going to be secretion. You can see secretion taking place here. Uh, with some of those drugs and poisons, again, with some hydrogen ions that are here, um, are going through a process of secretion. So these are two green arrows here representing secretion. So we take a look at reabsorption. Um, reabsorption is basically... Um, um, I'm sorry, take a look at secretion. Secretion is basically reabsorption in reverse, in which we're going to go from the bloodstream, which we're going to go from those protubulary capillaries, now we're going to go into the tubules themselves. Um, things that tend to get, uh, uh, that go through the, uh, the reabsorption process, I'm sorry, my bad. Things that tend to go through the tubular secretion process um, are hydrogen and potassium ions, um, creatinine, um, is, a, is an important substance that's going to get uh, secreted. Creatinine, guys, is the uh, is formed from the breakdown of creatine, um, which is uh, one of the ways your body is able to uh, to build ATP is through the creatine phos uh, through creatine phosphate. And if we break down that uh, if we break down that phosphate off that creatine phosphate, um, what we have as a byproduct is creatinine. So muscle metabolism. Um, in order, uh, part of the breakdown of that is going to be creatinine that your body is going to produce. Um, and this gets secreted um, as well. Um, this process is important, guys, of getting rid of substances not already in the filtrate. So things that are not already in the filtrate that your body doesn't really need, um, that tend to be at relatively larger molecules your body couldn't filter out initially. And, uh, and that's what's going to happen uh, during the process of secretion. Once these materials are left in the renal tubules, um, they're going to go down the collecting ducts, and once they leave that collecting duct, they're officially called urine. Um, so that's how we officially get uh, what we call urine, is once it leaves that, uh, that collecting duct, then we actually have urine itself. So I'm just going to show you this, uh, this little demo here uh, on the computer itself. kind of goes over the process itself. Um, so we can see that right here is the renal cortex. Here's the renal medulla, and then here's the renal pelvis. Here's your renal artery. Here's your renal vein. Renal artery is going to be supplying this with blood. Uh, we'll move in here, get a little closer look here of the kidney. So once we zoom in on a kidney, 
um, we can see that it has these little filtration units that we call nephrons. Um, note this nephron um, is sitting in between the cortex and the medulla. I can see the major parts of the nephron here that I'm looking at right here is going to be this uh, the glomerulus that's right here. Um, right here is the Bowman's capsule. And then right here is going to be the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, your distal convoluted tubules here, and then here's your collecting duct. We're going to zoom in a little bit further here on the nephron. And uh, we're going to kind of see how this game is played here with the nephron. I'm going to click on a substance. And you're going to see if it gets reabsorbed or what happens to it. Um, so if I click on something like glucose, um, glucose is going to get filtered out initially here in the glomerulus that you're going to see. But then you're going to see the process of reabsorption occur. Because remember, our body wants to keep glucose. So we'll watch glucose in action here. There it goes through the glomerulus. Now it's in the proximal convoluted tubule. And then immediately right there, it just got reabsorbed. So your body held on to the glucose. Note that glucose reabsorption occurred right away in that proximal convoluted tubule where most of your reabsorption occurs initially is in that proximal convoluted tubule. Let's take a look at something like water. Water is going to be very interesting because uh, your body is composed of 60% of your body is composed of water. Um, so next time you set foot on a scale, don't be discouraged. Uh, I know I'm discouraged sometimes when I set foot on a scale, but I always have to remind myself that 60% of me is water. Um, a lot of this water you're going to see is going to get reabsorbed. Um, it's going to get filtered out initially in the glomerulus, but then it gets reabsorbed. Um, it gets reabsorbed throughout the whole entire nephron. Um, and you'll see it in action here. So water's up to bat, and here we go. You can see there is some reabsorption. There's more reabsorption. And there's even more reabsorption right there. So water got reabsorbed throughout the whole entire process, although some of that water did make its way down and became urine. Urea, um, urea is something that your body does not need. Um, so this should go through the process. We'll see if this goes through um, filtration or it has to go through the process of secretion. So see what happens with urea. Urea got filtered out. And it's going to go through the whole entire trip down the loop of Henle, up the loop of Henle to the distal convoluted tubule, from the distal line of distal convoluted tubule down the collecting duct, and now that's going to become urine. Let's see what proteins. Proteins are relatively large molecules. Um, your body normally wants to hold on to proteins themselves, although during some times of extraneous activity and exercise and stuff like that, your body will rid itself of some proteins. No, if the proteins were too large, so now they made their way in the particular capillaries, and your body's going to hold on to this protein. It's not going to go through the tubular, tubular secretion. It wants to keep that protein inside of it because a lot of the major building blocks of your body are of proteins. Let's take a look at sodium. Sodium got filtered out. And it got reabsorbed right there. Although some of the sodium is going to also um, become uh, become urine. So you can see, guys, that was just some uh, me just playing around with this little. Uh, that's off the biologymad.com um, thing we took a look at in class, kind of giving you an idea of how a nephron works and talks a little bit about tubular secretion and reabsorption. Kind of reaffirms those ideas that are very important. On your test, guys, you can expect to see a picture of a kidney. You can expect to see a diagram of a nephron. So I would know that this is the glomerulus. This is the Bowman's capsule. This is the afferent arterial. This is the efferent arterial. These are called protubulary capillaries that are surrounding the nephron. This is the proximal convoluted tubule. This is the loop of Henle. This is the distal convoluted tubule. This is the collecting duct. Things that I can ask you. I can ask you to draw arrows showing the way that urine traveled. Um, those different types of questions that I can ask you on the test. This is the activity that we did in class um, in which we identified areas of where reabsorption and secretion occur. I would go back over that activity and just kind of take a look at it again um, so you kind of get an idea of where these, these processes are occurring. Remember, you're going to have to know secretion. You're going to have to know reabsorption, what those terms mean. Um, so have an idea of what, how those arrows are going to look on that nephron when you're talking about reabsorption, when you're talking about secretion. So. When we take a look at urine, so, so what is found in urine? Um, and how much urine do we produce? 
So on average, we produce about 1 to 1.8 liters of urines produced. Um, remember, urine is different from filtrate. Um, filtrate is, uh, is those that components that are in the actual tubules themselves. Um, the stuff that leaves those tubules that comes out the collecting duct is what we refer to as urine. Um, filtrate is going to contain everything uh, that blood plasma does, with an exception to it doesn't contain any proteins. Um, urine is what remains after the filtrate is lost. Most of it's water. So we take the filtrate, we take most of the water, nutrients, and necessary ions out of it. Then you're going to have urine. Remember, you only produce one little raindrop of urine every single minute. Um, urine is also going to contain that nitrogenous waste and substances that are not needed by the body. So how does urine have that yellow color? That's a question that's asked a lot of times by students. And, and urine has that yellow color due to, a, due to a, a pigment that's known as urochrome. And uh, urochrome is produced by the destruction of red blood cells. In particular, we're breaking down the hemoglobin molecule. So when I break down a hemoglobin molecule, which basically a red blood cell is a giant, a giant satchel uh, of, of, of hemoglobin. So it's just basically a, a, a bag of a whole, whole bunch of hemoglobin molecules. When I break down hemoglobin, um, it becomes a chemical that's called urochrome. You can see that urochrome a lot of times, too. Um, if you ever had a bruise, a bruise goes from that color underneath your skin. It goes from like a, almost like a red color. That's an initial as that capillary bursts underneath your skin. Then it becomes a dark brown. Um, and then it goes like a black. And then it eventually goes to a yellow. That yellow color that you're seeing in a bruise is that urochrome um, as well as we, break down that, uh, as we break down that hemoglobin molecule. You see that urochrome um, in your urine as that yellow color. Um, is what's giving that distinctive yellow color is urochrome, which is the breakdown of that hemoglobin um, itself. Um, it is sterile, um, so it is sterile. Um, when we look at urine, it's slightly aromatic. It doesn't have a sweet smell to it, but it does have a, a kind of a ammonia-type smell to it. Um, and the pH tends to be around 6, so it has a pH of 6. Uh, what we're going to find in urine, we're going to find sodium, we're going to find potassium, we're going to find urea, uric acid, creatinine. We're going to find ammonia. We're going to find bicarbonate ions. These are things that we normally find in urine. Things we don't find in urine, okay? We don't expect to find glucose. If I find glucose in urine, that's a sure indication that I have some form of diabetes. Um, one of the form of diabetes that we dealt with in urine analysis is we dealt with an individual that had gestational diabetes. And that was diabetes brought on by pregnancy. Um, which will go away after pregnancy a lot of times, but gestational diabetes, remember, in, uh, in some of your other classes, you may talk about type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We normally don't find blood proteins in urine. Um, in times of physical exertion, physical activity, um, we will find some remnants of proteins, but a lot of times you keep proteins um, inside of your body, and we don't find those in urine at all. Um, you shouldn't be finding red blood cells. You'd not be finding red blood cells in your urine. Red blood cells in your urine are very bad. Um, it's an indication of kidney failure. Some type of kidney trauma could have occurred. But your body wants to keep red blood cells in it. We normally don't find hemoglobin in our urine either. Hemoglobin should not be found in urine. Again, you have kidney trouble, uh, kidney failure, these types of bad things. We find out if we do find these products in our uh, urine itself. We will find urochrome, which is the breakdown of uh, which is the breakdown of this hemoglobin. We will find hemoglobin itself. Um, white blood cells should not be found in urine. Um, remember, if you have white blood cells in your urine, that's an indication that you're fighting off a urinary tract infection uh, because white blood cells are able to go to those areas where there's infection that's occurring. So we should not find white blood cells in our urine. You should also not find bile in your urine. You should not find bile in your urine at all um, either. Some of the other things that we dealt with in, in the urinalysis activity um, that we did in class um, as we dealt with a lady that had a whole bunch of ketones in her urine. If I find ketones, high levels of ketones in my urine, that's a sign that my body's going through rapid weight loss. Um, because when I break down fat, part of the breakdown of fat is I'm going to produce ketones, and these ketones are going to be evident in my urine. Uh, sometimes people with diabetes, um, they have high levels of ketones in their urine. Um, reason being is because they're not getting that glucose absorbed into their bloodstream, so your body's going to start tapping into fat in order to produce that ATP itself. These are some of the disorders that, that result um, from having these, uh, these different substances in your urine itself. Um, and you guys can take a look at this. So we take a look at some of the differences uh, between the urinary system between a male and a female. 
Um, one of the major differences that we have is the size of the urethra. Um, so the length in a female is 3 to 4 centimeters. In a male, um, it's about 20 centimeters. Um, the location in the females is along the walls of the vagina. In the males, it runs through the prostate, um, and then it runs through the penis. In the males, the urethra hangs off the body a little bit more than that of a female, um, which is why one of the reasons that females are more prone to urinary tract infections is because of the closeness to the anal opening and the, and the urethral opening um, itself. And then that just leaves it uh, relatively close for equal lie and stuff like that to, uh, uh, to make it relatively easy for uh, infection to occur um, or bacterium to get into the urethra, which is why females are more prone to uh, UTIs um, than males. Basically, uh, the function's a little bit different uh, between the two. Um, in a female, the urethra is just going to carry urine itself, is what all it's going to carry. In males, it also has a reproductive function in that the urethra is going to be a passageway for these sperm cells, as well as urine. We take a look at uh, voiding or matriculation. It's also called so urination, matriculation, and voiding. Um, this is the process of which your body is ridding itself um, of this urine. And basically, you have two sphincters, and uh, both these sphincters just must open up um, in order for your body to, uh, to allow um, urine to, uh, to, uh, to go out into the external environment. Um, so you have an internal sphincter, and you have an external sphincter that you can see right here. Um, this internal sphincter, this, your, your, your bladder can hold about 500 milliliters of urine. Um, before you feel this need to void. And uh, basically, this is going to open up. The internal sphincter is going to open up. And it's going to press on this external sphincter itself. And that's when you get, kind of get alerted that, hey, you have to use the bathroom at this point. And then the second sphincter is going to open up here. And then this uh, urine is going to uh, trickle its way down um, and out into the external environment into the toilet itself. But about 500 milliliters is when, uh, is when you start to recognize that, hey, you gotta, you got to use the bathroom at this particular point itself. Notice you have both urethras um, draining, uh, I'm sorry, both ureters um, draining into the kidneys right here and right here. So here's both your ureters coming in on either side of the uh, uh, of the bladder. So this is your bladder that's right here, and then you have a ureter here, ureter here draining into it. Uh, remember, you're producing one little raindrop every single minute. The kidneys have a ba have a basic role um, in maintaining the blood. Um, composition. They're going to get rid of nitrogenous base waste. They're going to maintain water balance. They're going to maintain electrolyte balance. And they're also going to ensure uh, proper pH. How do we maintain water balance um, is what I'm going to talk a little bit about here next. We did a whole entire uh, uh, feedback loop um, dealing with maintaining water balance. Um, when we look at females, they're composed of 50% water. Um, young males are composed of about 60% water. Babies are about 75% water, and then the elderly are about 45% water. Um, the reason that your body needs to have water in it um, is one of the major regions is that things dissolve relatively easily in, in water. And uh, because it, it dissolves things relatively easy, it makes an easy way for things to be able to travel through your body. Um, it's through this watery lake uh, matrix itself. Note, as you get older, your water uh, composition decreases. Um, part of that being is because you start to have less water mass, less muscle mass that's associated with yourself as you age, and uh, therefore because you have less muscle mass, you're going to hold less water. Males tend to have more water um, associated with them because they tend to have more muscle mass. We take a look at where I find um, uh, water at in my body, or where I find this fluid at. Um, we have intracellular fluid, um, which is going to be found inside of cells. Um, so about two-thirds of the body fluid um, is going to be found within, within inside cells. Um, and then we have extracellular fluid, um, which is found outside the cells. This is called, this is going to be found in interstitial fluid. This is also going to be found in your blood plasma. So when we take a look at this water composition inside of our body, um, this, this diagram can be kind of confusing, um, but I'll try to explain it here. What this is saying is that when I take a look at my, 60% uh, of my body weight is this water. Okay, so I have about 60% of my total body weight is, is going to be composed of water. So of this 60% of my body weight, 40% of it is going to be found, okay, 40% of this water is going to be found in cells. So 
we call this intracellular fluid. So 40% of all the water in my body is found in, in, inside my cells. So that remains that I have another 20% that's found somewhere else. Where do I find this other 20%? This other 20% is either going to be found, is found what we call extracellular fluid. So 20% is going to be found in this extracellular fluid. This extracellular fluid is made up of blood plasma, and it's also made up of interstitial fluid, which is just basically fluid that's surrounding the cells. So of this 20%, okay, of this 20% that I, that I have here, of this extracellular fluid, 80% of this 20% is found surrounding the cells themselves, what we call interstitial or interstitial fluid. And then the remaining 20% of this initial 20% that's here, okay, that makes up this percent that's here is going to be is going to be composed of our blood uh, of our plasma volume itself, which is found in our blood. So of this twenty percent, eighty percent, twenty percent makeup of it is kind of how we break down. Can I have your attention, please? Clayton. I hope that uh, I hope that made sense to you. I know that that can be kind of confusing when I look at this uh, um, diagram, but that's how we break down the interstitial and the blood plasma is 80% of this 20%, and 20% of this is going to be uh, the blood plasma. 80% is going to be found interstit interstitially um, or interstitially when we look at it. I hope that made sense. If that didn't make any sense to you, just let me know, and I'll try to uh, re-explain it to you. But the majority of the fluid is found, um, of the water, is found within our cells. When we take a look at how our body maintains water balance, um, our water intake must equal water output. Um, the thirst mechanism is a driving force for water intake. Remember, our thirst mechanism a lot of times is controlled by that vasopressin, um, alerting us that, hey, you know, we're low on water, and we want to we want to conserve water in our bodies, and we might want to get a drink of water uh, some way. This is kind of showing you uh, where our water comes from um, inside of our bodies itself. Let me move this into an area that you guys can kind of see here. So when we look at, uh, so when we look at where we get water from, um, so we get water from metabolism. Remember the part of the breakdown of cellular respiration is to produce water. We get water, 30% of our water comes from food, and then things that we drink is where we get water. So this water intake must equal the water output itself. So where do we lose water to? Well, we lose water through our fecal matter. Remember, not all that water is reabsorbed um, in that large intestine. Um, we lose some of it through sweat. Um, we lose some of it through the skin itself um, and our lungs um, through respiration. And then we lose a lot of our water's lost through uh, urine itself. So these two must equal out um, for us to maintain homeostasis. So what we put in must equal what we uh, put out. This is, uh, this is the, the feedback loop that we did in class um, dealing with anti-diuretic hormone. Um, inside your hypothalamus, you have little tiny cells that are called osmoreceptors. And osmoreceptors are going to kind of recognize um, when you have high levels or low levels of water. Um, if your water levels become too low, these osmoreceptors are going to uh, detect it and they're going to become more active. And then they're going to alert the hypothalamus. Um, a part of the hypothalamus to release uh, to release antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. Um, this vasopressin is going to target the nephrons, and basically it's going to cause the nephrons to release more um, channel proteins, and they're going to release more channel proteins so more water reabsorption can occur. Um, so that's kind of the effect that this antidiuretic hormone has. This is that antidiuretic hormone that's going to present excess water loss in urine. It's going to cause the kidneys collecting ducts to reabsorb more water because it's causing these collecting ducts um, to produce more channel proteins and release those onto the, uh, the nephron itself. Um, one of our patients that we had during urinalysis um, had this disorder that was called diabetes encephalitis. And uh, diabetes encephalitis occurs when antidiuretic hormone is not being released. Um, for some odd reason, this could be tumor based. It could be a pituitary, or a, it could be a, a, a tumor that's taking place in that particular area itself, um, and, uh, and and that can cause the the lack of release of this antidiuretic hormone. This is called diabetes encephalitis. You guys had a case of that young boy that was urinating at night, um, had a history of pituitary problems themselves, and uh, and that was causing the uh, the uh, the the uh, the release of this, uh, the lack of release of this antidiuretic hormone. 
so yeah, the uh, the antidiuretic hormone um, is going to be uh, released um, when uh, the osmoreceptors detect that there's low levels of water. And when they detect that there's low levels of water um, in your blood, um, they're going to communicate via neuron to that posterior pituitary. Remember that posterior pituitary is all uh, is, is is all nervous tissue. That's where the hypothalamus stores its hormones at, and uh, that's how that's going to be released. And the antidiuretic hormone is going to target, like I said, it's going to target the kidney, specifically the nephrons, to cause the nephrons to reabsorb more water <clears throat> because they're going to produce or release more of those little tiny channel proteins. Um, they're going to allow water, more real water reabsorption to occur. Um, this diabetes encephalitis, um, like I said, is, is occurring when you have some type of, it. most of the time it's a pituitary tumor um, that you have on that posterior pituitary, um, and uh, it's causing a problem for, uh, for this ADH that's just not being released at all. And this leads to these huge outputs of this dilute uh, urine. A lot of times this individual is going to take some type of medication that's going to contain these hormones in it. Um, just kind of like a supplement that they'll take uh, every day for the rest of their lives. Aldosterone. Um, aldosterone is basically um, going to uh, control your sodium content is what it does. And uh, it, it, it promotes the reabsorption of sodium ions themselves. Um, but remember, water is always going to follow salt. Um, it's kind of how that game um, is played uh, when we take a look at aldosterone. So you basically have um, the two main hormones that you have are going to be, uh, for water reabsorption, are going to be the vasopressin and the aldosterone. Um, this is just showing you uh, the difference between the uh, male and female. I mean, when we take a look at the male, the male has something called the prostate gland. And the, uh, the prostate gland surrounds the, uh, the, uh, the urethra itself. So the prostate gland is going to sur surround the urethra um, itself. And as a man ages, sometimes you get what's called an enlarged prostate. And the way that you can tell if, if you have an enlarged prostate is to uh, watch your flow of urine. If your flow of urine isn't a steady stream, but more of just kind of like a dribble or a trickle, um, that can mean that you have a, an enlarged prostate, which could be prostate cancer, which if diagnosed early is relatively curable. Um, remember, this prostate, females don't have a prostate gland. Um, males do um, for reproductive purposes. But it surrounds this urethra um, itself. And, uh, and that can lead to uh, uh, an, an early diagnosis of it is your, is your steady stream of uh, urine has been lessened to just that of a trickle. Um, as you age in the urinary system, uh, basically the, the urinary system's function declines as you age. The bladder is going to shrink. Um, and because it, it shrinks, um, you have to go more often. So the frequency of urination is going to increase. And also these sphincters wear out over time, so you lose this muscle tone. Uh, so you have more of an urgency that you really have to go and you can't hold it in as long because of the muscle tone is also lost as you age. So some of these problems that happen, um, the first problem we have is you have this increased what we call urgency, feeling that you need to uh, void or to matriculate more often um, because you've lost this muscle tone. Um, you have to urinate more frequently because you've lost the actual size of your bladder is decreased, so you have more frequency. And because you have to go more frequently, a lot of times you have to get up and go at night. We call that nocturia. And then eventually you lose complete control um, over the ability. And uh, because these, uh, these muscles completely just uh, lose their complete function, and you, and you wind up with called incontinence, um, which you don't have any control uh, of, the, uh, of the urination process anymore. And then uh, in males, um, you wind up with something called urinary retention um, because you have this enlarged prostate. Um, and that you're able to hold in this urine um, because that prostate's enlarged uh, so much um, and you don't have that steady stream of urine that's occurring. So that's the, uh, the basics of the urinary system that you have to know for your test. Like I said, I would go back over some of those worksheets that we did in class. Um, take a look at the, uh, the PowerPoint again. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to come see me um, prior to the test. This is an easy organ system. The system's not that... Uh, that difficult to grasp. Study that nephron um, extensively and, uh, and know those different components of it. That tends to be the part that uh, students tend to mess up a little bit more uh, than, than other parts. But this is a test that uh, I imagine the majority of you are going to do relatively well. I wish you the best of luck.